And it goes like this, shout it aloud, don't hold back. Shout it aloud. Uh, there's, a, there's a tone with this passage. Uh, you, you can read it quietly and Anglicanly, or uh, you know, shout it aloud, don't hold back. Or it's, uh, it's actually full volume. Shout it aloud, he's, God is saying to Isaiah. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. Happy days. For day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed Yet, says God, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this... The kind of fast I have chosen only for a day for, for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls. Restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honourable, and if you honour it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Fantastic. Brilliant passage. Um, Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. 58.12. Isaiah 58.12. You uh, have got it there on the screen. That's the verse that we're using for the project that we're uh, uh, engaging with as a community over the next few years. Uh, The project of renewing and restoring the broken walls, not just the physical broken walls that we see around us, but the, uh, the emotional and the spiritual broken walls of people's lives and hearts. To lift people back into their rightful identity as Christ's people, as 
as people who, who are made in the image of God, full of the Spirit. That's what uh, James was uh, talking about when he was talking about the Spirit of uh, the creative Spirit of God falling on people and then, then becoming the, tr- the true person that they're made to be. That's what the wreck house is about. That's what Rose Cottage is about. When Nathan brings people in, into his family, into his community, and they come to life under his wings and uh, they flourish. That's what the youth work is all about. It's what Luke started and it's what Rob carries on. It's, it's, what, it's all, all of the things that we do. It's about changing people's lives. But who is going to get that promise? Who, is going to, who are going to be the inheritors of that promise? Who are going to be the ones who raise up the ancient walls? Who is this referring to? It's for those who live for God and who worship God with their whole lives. Uh, our mission as a church family, uh, it's written on the bottom of our notice sheet each week, our mission is to make disciples and to be a growing community of people who worship God with their whole lives. Uh, we have a, stra- a strap line, uh, St. Michael's, living for God. It's on our notice board. We want to be a people who live for God. What does it mean to live for God? What kind of fast would, it, would qualify you as someone who lives for God? What's the criteria? Well, on this passage, which is one of the key passages uh, of Scripture, I would say, and it's one of the clearest articulated passages of what God requires of us. There are other passages as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love uh, God with all your heart and soul. But this is kind of like really practical uh, ideas of what God wants. What kind of fast do you want? How do you be part of his family? Uh, he, he, get, he breaks it down to some very simple things. Money, hospitality. How are we doing? How are we doing money-wise and hospitality-wise? How are we doing with our... I mean, so that's the question. God's going to go. So how are you doing money-wise? You, you come to worship. Great. Lovely. With my hands lifted high. Is that the kind of fast God is into? Actually, according to the passage, he's into... If your hands are lifted high, but you're not doing something else with your hands, putting them in your pocket and taking out money, then there's something wrong. There's a disconnect. So there's something about money, and, and there's something about hospitality. How are we doing hospitality-wise? Uh, giving shelter to people, uh, bringing people into our homes, uh, sharing our food with those who need it, uh, clothing people who are naked. You know, I'm looking at you. You're nodding away. Uh, you know what that's like to be overwhelmed by God's love and God's grace as people have responded to you. That's beautiful, isn't it? And then there's justice. Uh, are we a people of justice? Are we making justice? Are we, or are we, are we siding with the oppressors in any sort of way at all? And that can be uh, not just here in, the, in, in, in England, but it can also be, are we buying clothes with justice in mind? Are we buying food with justice in mind? Are we, living, uh, are we doing housing with justice in mind? Are we living according to just rules? Yeah. And then there's, of course, the story of relationships. It says, if you look after your own flesh and blood, uh, we have the benefit, don't we, the joy of living in a, wealth, a, a, a state which has welfare attached to it. You know, welfare is so much part of our, our common good together as a community. But in, in the day that this was written, there was no kind of support network underneath the family. So uh, when your aunt was ill, uh, who looked after it? The family did. When your uh, brother was ill, who looked after him? You did. When your daughter was ill, who looked after her? You did. The family had to gather around. So who was going to look after your own flesh and blood? No one else was. You would have to. And, and God said, your family is really important for looking after each other. So how are we doing family-wise at the moment? Family-wise is always a complicated one, isn't it? How are you doing? If you look after your family, if you do not neglect your own flesh and blood, then you will rise. That's, that's, that's the link. And of course, then there's the last, the last one, which we often miss off because it's at the end of the long passage and we get bored by then. And it's also about the Sabbath. And we've given up the Sabbath, haven't we? So we kind of ignore that one. That was for the Old Testament and we're New Testament people. We don't do the Sabbath. But here's something about the honor and respect of being in God's rhythm, in God's way, living a, a, a rhythmic life in, in peace with him and not working every day that God sends, but having a day off to enjoy him and to honor him as Lord. That's the challenge there, isn't it? So I'm with... That's who, that's who it applies to. And what are the promises? The promises are amazing. If you lose your life, you will gain it. You'll find it. So what do we find? We find amazing things. You will shine. Uh, I woke up this morning early. I don't know if any of you woke up early. Anyone wake up early? Yeah, yeah. Some of us, uh, even before the sun had risen, we woke up. But when the sun rose this morning, wasn't it beautiful? I mean, the sun shines and it rises. It's a glory, isn't it? And I just uh, walked around the church and uh, went down to the office and I finished off today's preparation for today's talk. Don't judge me for being last minute, but uh, just just know that the Spirit's on it. It's all right. Uh, But uh, as the sun shone, it was just beautiful being in the sun. And the the promise is that we will rise like the sun. We will rise like the sun. That's a beautiful image, isn't it, for us? If you put these things in, you'll be like the sun rising over the sun. I mean, it's just like we all go, wow, that's nice. We will be like that, and everyone go, oh, that's nice. Look at them. They're just rising. Oh, yeah. Look at them. 
What a great group of people into it. And look at them. They're shining like the sun. And then you'll find guidance in your life. You'll know. I mean, hands up. Who doesn't need guidance? I, everyone needs guidance. We've all got issues. We all want to find out. God will guide you. And he'll lead you and he'll satisfy your needs. In a sun-scorched land, you'll have plenty. Rather than everyone else, you'll have, you'll have what you need. Your daily bread will be given. And then you'll have streams, living water, flowing through you. This sense of animation. About, so if you, if you put yourself into God's, if you align yourself with the kingdom of God, we know this story again and again. If you align yourself into the dome of God's kingdom, the kingdom, if you come into it, then you get his life. We, you know, we look for peace. Well, Jesus is our peace. And we look for joy. We look for security. We come into the kingdom of God. We align ourselves completely. Now, we leave behind everything else in order to enter the kingdom of God, and then we receive all these blessings. If you lose your life for my sake, said Jesus, you will find it. So we step into this life. <sighs> it's a good introduction. Why are you here? Why am I here? Uh, I'm here because of this passage, really. Isaiah 58. When I was 16, 17, 18, can't quite remember the year, but I was at a, a summer conference, and uh, it was, there was music and creativity and art, and then there was... Uh, some talks, Bible talks as well. Uh, and uh, this preacher man uh, stood up and he, he told his story. And he'd been a middle-class kid like me. And then God had uh, kind of taken him back to Scripture and he'd, and he'd begun to explore Scripture and discovered that God was actually, ever and again, he raised his voice, like in Isaiah 58. And he got angry about a few things. And it seems as if he noticed for the first time, because he hadn't learned it from his Sunday school, he'd learned it as an adult, he suddenly noticed that God was angry about particular things. And injustice and poverty and inequality were some of the things that he was most angry about. So he did a little study. He started at the beginning and he read the whole Bible from beginning to end to look out for every verse to do with poverty and wealth and injustice. And all the ones that, you know, that, that, that are there, they're at the rich young ruler or uh, the stories in, in the prophets. Or he, and he just took his pair of scissors and he cut out every single verse that had anything to do with it. So he could put it in a scrapbook. So every single verse, he started at the beginning and he filled up a scrapbook full of stuff with all of these verses. So he cut out the whole of Isaiah 58. That was, that was out, well, the whole of it. And all of Jesus' teaching on wealth and poverty and all of that sort of stuff. He just cut it straight out. Guess what he had? He had a scrapbook full of, of stuff. He discovered that it was the second most thing that God talked about more than anything else in the whole of Scripture. Idolatry was the other one. If you follow me, if you love me. The next one after that was this stuff about money and wealth and inequality and justice. He had the promises of when, when, when everything comes to its conclusion, when justice flows like rivers. Everything, and he said, cut it out. But he also had a Bible that was full of holes. He called it his holy Bible. And he held up his holy Bible. A guy called Jim Wallace, he held up his holy Bible in front of me. He said, that's what you do when you take out justice and poverty and what God feels about in inequality in, in Scripture. That's what you do. That's what you get. Your Bible is in tatters. Now, I was taught as a good Christian young boy, brought up in the Christian home, that if it's in the Bible, you should do it. It's good. Quite simple. Don't, not too complicated. If it's in there, it's a good thing. A little bit nuanced now as an adult. Not everything in there is perfect. You know, some of it is, needs a little bit of thinking through. Uh, you know, don't copy every single person in the Bible. But, there are some, uh, but the point being is true, isn't it? That if it's in there, it's good. And I suddenly just had to work out, being I was 16, 17, 18, well, how am I going to live my life if this bit is in there? How am I going to follow this way? And I decided that uh, I was uh, training to be a, an art student. I was at uh, art college doing foundation course, like Angus did. And, um, and I, went to, I, want, I had a place at Wimbledon School of Art to do theatre design, which is the best of all art uh, careers because you get to do the small stuff, you get to do the big stuff, you get to do clothes, you get to do uh, big backdrops, you get to do lighting, you get to do furniture design, you get to do, you know, everything is theatre design. Basically, it's because I couldn't choose which to do, so I just chose one that had them all in, and so I had theatre design as my thing. But then I thought, Isaiah 58, theatre design. Now, I'm not, it's no criticism of anyone who does theatre design, like, God bless them. But I just couldn't, in my own heart, put the two together. I was thinking, who goes to theatres? The top 5, 10%, top 5%, 2% of the, of the nation go to theatres. If I want to release 
the yoke of oppression or if I want to be part of God's story about uh, sorting out some of the stuff in the world that he seems to be angry about, maybe theatre design isn't the best place to do it. So I decided that instead of doing that, I would go and look after old people in the day. So I became a, a home care assistant. I got given a luminous green jacket. I don't know, they, they had uh, luminous, it was, I don't know why it was, it was, it was a, it wasn't quite luminous, but it felt luminous when I put it on. Everyone else had a tabard. They had a tabard. You know the tabards. The, the ladies, had, I was the only man. There's a story. I was the only man. I was also the youngest by far. I was 18, 19 at the time. And, I, and they didn't want to give me a tabard because they thought that looked stupid. So they bought me this, in the same material, the same color, a jacket. It was repulsive. Anyway, so I put on this repulsive jacket and went around and these people, oh my goodness, who are you? Anyway, so I looked after old people and then I did youth work in the afternoon. And why am I sharing that? It's because somehow this scripture has been really important all the way through my life. It shaped my life. So it's, ended, it's, it's actually brought me to Twerton. And when someone said there's a job in Bath, I, I, I thought, well, why would I want to go to Bath? I mean, who lives in Bath? It's not exactly where you find a yoke of oppression, is it, in Bath? And God's not that interested in Bath. And, and I felt... Of course, you understand what I'm saying. God loves everyone equally. He loves everyone equally. But uh, if I have a calling for myself, it's that I must be part of some story that is about good news to the poor. And then I discovered that Twerton wasn't quite like the rest of Bath. And so it became part of my calling to come here in, in Twerton. And of course, we know that there are a multitude of different things going on in our lives here. Which is the one that's pressing in on you at the moment, uh, in your family? Is it mental health? Is it addiction? Is it... Low expectations. Is it the uh, older age? Is, some, is someone in your family going through the, the, the stuff about being isolated and lonely? Uh, what about is it disability? Is it death? Is it family breakdown? Is it education? Is it jobs? Is it work? Is it young people? Is it loneliness? What is it about? Then we know that these things are all around themselves and they express themselves every single day in our street. Now, I, I walk up and down the street a lot. It's a bit overwhelming sometimes, so I scurry sometimes and I hide. I don't know if you do that. I, I, I don't have capacity all the time to be available for all of the stuff all of the time. So sometimes the office is a secure place, safe place to be. But God has called us, hasn't he? He's called us in this, into this community. Sometimes here is a really safe place, isn't it? It's kind of okay in here. And we step outside and we think, oh no, here we go again. I'm going to step into this stuff where it's complicated and messy and demanding. But this is our calling on us, isn't it? And that's why we do the rec house, it's why we do Rose Cottage, it's why we do the youth work. And it's a calling of love, isn't it? Jesus looked out on the crowds and he had compassion on them. It comes, came from his gut. And that comes from us, it comes in us sometimes. You have that feeling sometimes, that feeling of compassion, where you feel that kind of sense of something inside you. It's not I ought to feeling, I, kind of, I, I need to do this because it's the right thing, but it's I want to. It's I want, I want to be part of a story of transformation. I feel bad. I want, I move towards, it comes from a place of love. And that's our story, isn't it? That's all of your stories. You, you've experienced these things as well. You've had that feeling where you've just kind of almost cried. Have you had that feeling when you've cried about some of the issues? Maybe you've been praying here in church on Sunday or maybe just as you've been at school or whatever, you just kind of felt, ah, oh, the needs around. God, come and do something. And then there's the building. I don't know if you've noticed, but the building has some issues. And uh, ever since I arrived, we've noticed that the building's had some issues. And it's been a bit of an, another one of those things. You know, it's enough of an issue outside of the building. And then you come into the building, you think, oh, the building's great and beautiful and wonderful, but it's also got some issues. Now, if you like conflict, you'd go straight into that. you think, great, let's sort it out. Let's do something. If you don't like conflict, like me, you kind of like think, well, let's not do that right now. Let's pause for a little bit and let's, let's do the building issue a little bit further down the line. So I poured myself in the early stage of being here into all the other things which are important. And a lot of you are the fruit of that work. You know, you, you've come and joined me in that work outside, wanting to be on mission. We spend way more than most churches on mission. Virtually all of our money is spent not on Sunday morning, but it's spent in the week. So we have an amazing amount of money coming into us, but it all gets spent out in the week. I know, I know Joel and I cost a lot on Sunday morning, but most of our time is spent, <laughs> spent in the week. Mark gives his time 
uh, on Sundays for free. He does this for free. I know he, he gets paid rest of the week. All the money goes for him to pay. And he just comes on, on Sunday just out of his love, like, like we all do in a way. So we spend most of our time and most of our money outside, but of course there's this building, and it became a bit of an issue for us. And, and at PCC, we talk about the building. And of course, if you ever have a bill on your house, you know what it's like. You know, the boiler breaks down or something. So we've had the boiler break down. Do you remember the boiler breaking down and when we had to go into the local school? And do you remember when the roof and the lead got nicked? Do you remember when the, like, serially lit, nicked? Yeah. Ian was going to sort them out. He knew who did it. He was going to go and sort them out. <laughs> we, we, we've, had, uh, we've had all sorts of issues going on with our building. And then the, the plaster's come off. Uh, and we've taken it off because the water was coming in. We've had leaks. Uh, we've got woodworm. We've got, you know, the, you know, it's just everything. It's been a problem to us. Every aspect of the church's fabric construction needs attention. I mean, every aspect of it. Leaking roofs, porous walls, rotten the uneven floors, temperamental heating, outdated electrics, all need urgent and substantial work. Um, when the quinquennial came in, the architect every five years does a survey of the church. And you had a new architect. He did a survey and he went thumbs down. This is bad news, guys. He then put, we got a price put on the thing. It was about £800,000 worth of renewal needed to happen. So he prayed which is the right thing to do in such situations. There are three kinds of people in our church. There are those who have a really strong attachment to the building. They love it. They like the feel of the thing. They like sitting on the chairs called the pews. They like, they like the look of the thing. They like the history of the thing. They like the feeling of the thing. They're proud of it. It has emotional connections with them. Their family got baptized here or married here or they had a funeral here. It's part of them. They feel it. It's like... It's like there's something in them. It matters. When it's like this, when it's broken, it feels bad for them. They have a strong attachment to the building. So that might be you. There's another group of people who are a bit further away from them. And for them, the building is here or there. It's neither, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. It's just the building. They walk through the doors. It's nice. They'll take it. It's great. But they don't really want to spend much of their money on it. They're glad that it's here. They're glad we haven't got to spend money on other buildings, but they don't, re they don't really feel really strongly about it. It doesn't emotionally connect with them. And they'd be happy to meet in a school hall or somewhere else. Does that ring true for anyone in the room? And then there are people in the middle. They're neither people who, they kind of feel, they feel they understand the emotional connection, and they also understand that it's not about the building, it's also about the community and about doing stuff. And they ask God, how on earth can we sort out this building? It's just such a big issue. Three groups of people, none of whom who have faith for wanting to change things or really want to sort things out. Kind of a difficult place. If you're a church leader, you'll understand. If you're a church leader, who are the church leaders in the room? All of you are church leaders. I, I can but um, the, uh, it, you understand that this is not a, it wasn't a really great kind of mood in the room to want to pray because one lot are praying out of anxiety that things might change. Another group are praying, that, uh, praying out of anxiety that things might not, uh, we'd have to spend a load of money that they don't really want to spend. And one lot uh, anxiety because we'll never get off the ground and it's a waste of time even starting. So everyone's in a place of anxiety. Anyway, we prayed and God came. God came and helped us through that process. It took a little while for God to speak to us, but we, we got some clear answers. And God said, the days of fixing and making do have come to an end. It's a good, clear message. He also said, to conserve the past, you need a new vision for the future. It needs to become more than it has been in the past. It's been great. This space has been great, but it, it could be so much more. You need to unlock it. You need to open it up. It needs to become the heart of the community once again, as it was when it was first built. It needs to become for everyone rather than just for the, for the insiders. So heart open, everyone. And he also said, you need to make the most of everything you've got. Do you remember the story of the, of the boy with the two fishes and the five loaves? And he brings them to Jesus. And this is kind of a very significant moment in the story because as we were gathering around as a group praying, uh, the image of this story came to mind. And, and it was as if, you've got so much, you just need to offer it to me and, and let me break it open. You need to let me break it open you need to let go of it, you need to let me break it open, and then you let me give it away again. But you've got something already. What have we already got? We've got an amazing building. I heard of a church recently that wants to worship down in the centre of town, that they might have to spend £2,000 a week in order to worship down in the centre of town. 
in order to hire a space big enough to worship. And then that doesn't mean that with all the musical equipment in the, ha- in the place, they would have to, to use that space. That's just the space. They'd have to put all their shit. That's a lot of money, isn't it? We don't have to spend a pound to open the door. It's just here. What have you already got? Well, here is what we already had 140 years ago. And as you can see, the church, the tower, is identical almost, except for the first bit just here, which is a little bit different. On your way out, you can have a look, see if you can notice the differences. But you can also see that the church, the church body has got long, tall windows, two-storey, quite high and quite narrow. This is what it looks inside. You can see that there's no central aisle. It, the pulpit's quite central, and it's all about everyone being able to see the pulpit. It's a teaching church, isn't it? Um, and... Uh, and, it, and it's, uh, it looks like a Baptist church, doesn't it? Has anyone noticed that? Is it kind of something like that? In, in 1896, they, uh, it, was, it needed repair, it needed res- restoration, needed, but uh, there was a new vision for the future. And in fact, the new vision was also about a new way of worshipping. Instead of coming simply to listen to the teaching, you come, come more to, to go through to the communion table. So they put an aisle down the middle, and they wanted to create a different kind of culture, a different kind of way of doing it. And so they re- knocked down, completely knocked down. I mean, like, that's changed, isn't it? They didn't move anything. They just knocked it down. Amazing. They knocked down the church building, and they started putting up this. So this is the arch across here. And you can see there's nothing. There's just sky above when you see the arch. And this is looking that way, and you can imagine what that's like. You can see the, the beginnings of the old tower, and you see the, the arches just beautifully put in, these, these arches here. And then you can see these, um, the first or a number of these roof beams put in. Can you look up and see the kind of roof beams? You can see the lovely little bits of woodwork put up. So that was 100 years ago or so. And this is what it looked like after everything had finished. And uh, it's the new wall, and they'd landscape the whole spot. And doesn't that look clean and fresh? I mean, just doesn't it look beautiful and it looks accessible? And, uh, you know, it looks inviting and welcoming and open. And uh, <coughs> so it, what struck me as I was looking at those uh, old photographs was just how ambitious they were. It was, it, does anyone know who, who gave us the money to do that? The yeah, the Carr family. That's right, the Carr family. He, he was a rich uh, mill owner down on the, on the, str- on the river, and he, he, he earned lots of money, and he wanted to give the whole community a new church. I'm kind of praying that there'll be somebody else in our own day who will come along and help us, who may own a mill or something else on the other side of town. And possibly, you never know, it's being recorded. It could be speaking to you right now as I speak. If it's you, you know who it is. Uh, uh, Just, uh, yeah, so there might be somebody who who hears that. You know, a million pounds sounds an awful lot of money to me. Uh, but there are people with capital in houses that they haven't earned. So it's just gone up because house prices have gone up. They bought their house in 1978, and it was 50,000 or 25,000. And now that house is 650,000 or 800,000 or a million pounds or whatever. That's just they didn't do nothing. They just lived, and that's great. It may be possible that 10 people have 100,000 to spare across the city. I'm talking across the city. And that they could bring their money, like they did to the apostles. They brought their money to the apostles' feet and gave it up. So I'm hoping that there'll be a, a, a kind of a, a sense of us being able to feel ambitious. So we asked our architect to draw up a, a plan, not just of the a reworking of the interior or the restoration of the roof, but what would it look like if we really opened this building up, if we gave it to Jesus and said, Jesus, what would you do if we really broke this space up and they opened, up this, opened up the whole landscape? And the architect has had some really great fun redesigning the inside of the church so that it's kind of open for all kinds of things, of all ages, whether you're young or whether you're old. But he's also had some fun redesigning the landscape around the edge to make it more accessible, less bumpy, uh, kind of taking away the hedges. He's thought about what would it be like to move the war memorial instead of it being slightly off kilter, putting it in a more central space and clearing away the the tree so you can see it and you can actually em- embrace it so that, that can become more central to our community again. And he's thought, how can we link up what we've already got, which is the rec house down here and the church building up there? So what he's done is he's, he's kind of gone out and then across. So you've got this L-shaped building. So what would it be like if we went through there and then ended up into the back end of the rec house and then went downstairs into the rec house and that could all become one space? 
And what can you do with that space? He kind of helped us to imagine, what could we do with those kind of spaces to bless our community? Well, of course, uh, the, the sky's the limit with our dreams. We've always had good dreams. And the needs are con- continue to be there. What will it do? Well, we need to repair and restore the building. We need to open up the whole site, give some space. Well, this is what it will do. The project will connect and develop the rec house with the main church building. So this, you imagine uh, an activity that happens in here, and then you, everyone could go out through the door down there and then down, uh, in, uh, down a lift into, into the rec house and then have another activity there, or vice versa, and cross over between the two. Uh, it can unlock the potential of this site. This site is worth millions of pounds. Millions of pounds. You know, on the, on the Windsor Bridge recently, um, they uh, sold uh, the BBC, uh, old BBC warehouse in the middle of the Windsor Bridge. Uh, not on the bridge, obviously, but just near the Windsor Bridge. And uh, three million pounds it cost for the land. This site is worth a huge amount, but it's all locked up. It's all closed down. How can we open up? What can we do to release the potential? And, of course, the purpose of all this is not about buildings, is it? It's about people. It's about people. So today we're going to make a start with this thing. You'll see a piece of paper in front of you which just has a little nudge towards, would you like to make a donation towards this? We need to make a start for the future. Um, Yesterday, uh, Joel's ordination, I'm coming down to land, please forgive me for speaking so long. But uh, uh, yesterday, I was at Joel's ordination and it was as if I was walking, you know that uh, you have um, a seesaw. You know when uh, when you, you walk up a seesaw, you go up, and then you get to the pivot point, and then you can go down the other side. Yeah. It feels to me in my life that I've been walking up the seesaw, and of course the plank looks like it's always going up, doesn't it? You just think, hey, life's getting good, it's great. And then suddenly the, it's going down. <laughs> and it feels like I've slightly gone across a little a pivot point. I don't, some of you understand what I'm talking about. The rest of you go, I haven't a clue what he's talking about. But this is what it feels like to be 49. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I'm noticing that it's not about me. It really isn't about me. It's about a future that comes beneath me. You know, people, kids who are being born now, like Freya, or you know, little Jenny's one inside her tummy, they're 49 years younger than me. They're 50 years younger than me. I'm going to be so gone by the time that they're like me. And so I'm just thinking, it's not about me. It's about kids coming through. You know, Josh started, when, do you remember Josh when he first was doing some youth work with, uh, with uh, Luke? He was, a, he was a little kid like this at the junior school. He's now up here, isn't he, Josh? It's about the future. It's about us investing in the future. It's also about us inviting others to join us. We need to tell our story so that other people can get on board. Uh, we've got a good story going here. Thank you for sharing that thing about our reputation. That's really moving, isn't it? It makes it feel good. Long may that continue. But we can't do this on our own. We really can't. And in fact, Twerton isn't ours. Twerton belongs to the whole city. The city will only be able to say it's healed when Twerton is healed. The city will only be able to say it's a great city when Twerton is sorted out. So the church is in Bath own us, or or rather, they're responsible for the needs of the poor in Twerton. The voice cries out like a trumpet to the whole church, not just to us. So there's an invitation to the rest of the church. Will you come and help us? Will you help us to be something here? Can we do it together? Can we be in partnership? But of course, I think we need to lead the way together as a church. We need to invest first. We need to get our hands in the pockets and start doing it ourselves. So that's what the piece of paper is about. You may not have brought money with you today. Doesn't matter. Write a number down. If you do write a number down on the piece of paper, someone will come and follow you up on it, And if you write your name on it. And it would be great if there was some money at some point that looked like the number. That would be great. Um, uh, but the purpose of it is really just for us to step into it. Now, it may be that you want to give 10 quid today, but that's your start. It may be that you want to give 100 quid And that's your start. It may be that you want to give a thousand quid, and that's your start. Because this is going to take us several years, and we're talking big money. If you want to do that online, if you haven't got the money today, you can do it on our website, 5812.com. It's fancy, 
website, really. Go and have a look at it. There's some videos as well. And also, we'd like to give to Sendicow. At the same time we, as giving to ourselves or into the mission here to the poorest, we want to give to the po people who are even poorer aside. So you may want to give, uh, let's say you gave £100. How about giving £5 of that £100 or £10 of that £100 to Sendicow as a way of, uh, of making sure that we could bless people who are even poorer than ourselves? So don't put that in the big collection bag. Uh, uh, there's a collection bag at the back. Ray, if you, I wonder if you could just go to the back and get the collection bags. Um, everything that you put in the collection bag today will go towards the building project. But if you want to give separately to Send a Cow, there's a little Send a Cow box that you can put your stuff in, and that will be ongoing for the next few weeks. This is all about us. It's about people. It's about us becoming a growing community of people who will be known for one thing, who will rebuild ancient ruins and raise up age-old foundations who will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets. We're doing. Shall we stand together? I'm just going to invite the Spirit to help us along. Uh, so let's just, um, just to stand is just a way of us shifting momentum a little bit. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you rest upon us? This is a simple transaction between us and you. It's not about anyone else in the room. It's just between us. Would you just settle on our hearts? What is right to give you? What is right to offer you as a gift?